Thank you, Rob. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a very restricted time frame this afternoon. I'm not used to talking for only 30 minutes. I'm trying to get the Russian thing going, where you can talk for hours and hours and hours. So therefore, I thought we would not have fun, but we would try and be slightly energised. And already something good has come out of my involvement with this conference, which I'll talk about a bit later. But just to set the scene, we've now had two bank officials speak to us. I want to ask you, without declaring necessarily what you think is going to happen at the next election or how you're going to vote, just to set the scene, how many of you, are like me, are on the conservative side of politics? Hands up. How many on the Labor side, as a generalisation? Come on, be brave. <laughs> like Hawthorne, you could still be a winner, so don't give it away. And how many of you are genuinely undecided? Well, that's a hopeless survey, I've got to say, <laughs> because only about 50 hands went up. But it is serious, because on one hand, you've heard from the ANZ about cyber security, and then you've heard of how the CBA is going to work with you. But I'd like to suggest to you at the moment that until we get clear leadership from Canberra in particular, we are all stuffed. <laughs> because we can't plan with certainty. That's not to say in society there isn't always change. But change has never been occurring faster. And unfortunately, the regulators are trying to outstrip the speed of change, so they're putting more and more pressure on us. But we've had this extraordinary situation where my side of politics has spent the last three weeks not only taxing the banks, but attacking them publicly. And if you can imagine that they were in opposition and Labor had done that, who do you think would be squealing the loudest? Our side of politics. The banks are important to our economy. That's not to say you can't bring about change, but you do that by influence, not by publicly attacking them, trying to reduce the public's confidence in the banking system, which got us through the GFC, and now you've seen the extraordinary system, uh, situation in South Australia, where their government has put another tax on the banks. The ramifications of this attack is going to affect you, and it's going to affect your clients. It's going to affect you as shareholders. It's going to affect you in terms of access to loans. It's going to affect you as industry tries to borrow more from the banks to grow the economy. And it's going to, within a very short period of time, feed through to the confidence within the community. So that, again, is going to affect you, your clients, and your own businesses, regardless of their size. The other issue that we're facing at the moment, which is going to have an enormous impact on this society, is this issue of energy and the cost of energy. I was with a couple of companies last night, a couple that I brought out to Victoria when I was uh, in office last century. <laughs> Their power bill has gone from $240,000 a year to $760,000. They only make one product. It's a consumable. They've told me they can't pass the cost on to the consumer because they won't buy the product and they can't absorb the cost and they are now going through the process of closing down. You are going to find within the next six to 12 months the greatest contraction of industry in Australia we have ever seen. And it's all self-inflicted. And the other side of that is, and you're now starting to see it on your television screens, is individual members in the community particularly those on low income, who say they can't pay their energy bills and they're going to the not-for-profits asking for help. And the divide between those who have sufficient to live or very wealthy, not that they matter because they'll survive under any circumstance, but that middle income group and particularly low income, the divide is going to get greater. And what does that do? That again reduces confidence in the society in which we live. So this is all happening at the same time at the speed of communications is getting quicker and quicker and quicker. 
and that itself is imposing a great deal of pressure on our society. Now, having said that, I don't want you to think for a moment that I am pessimistic. I'm not. I'm optimistic. <laughs> but we have had 28 years of growth in this country where we've been increasingly living beyond our means, and now our leaders, regardless of their politics, are doing things that are going to contract the size of our society. And at this stage, while people are mouthing sort of so-called solutions, even if you took the Finkel report, it's going to be five years before you see any benefit from it. New South Wales, Victoria, Northern Territory have limitations, restrictions on exploration for gas. So Victoria moves from a place where we were one of the lowest cost energy providers in the world to now where we have to import electricity and gas from interstate. So we're going to be confronted with an enormous amount of change. So as you gather here for this love-in <laughs> and as you talk to each other over the next few days, you've got to do so honestly and understand the environment in which we are all living. And sadly, I don't see any change from this failure of leadership in the not too distant future. Because our parliamentary terms are too short at three years, so you get in, you do whatever you want to do if you know what you're doing in the first year, and then you start undoing everything by the third. And so much of what is happening now is about today rather than tomorrow, let alone 2050. There is no vision for this country. There hasn't been for 20 years. And without a vision, you can't actually plan and prepare. You can't run risks with any sense of certainty. And risks are important because you don't grow unless you do things differently. And so therefore we keep hearing about the new word is disruptor. The greatest disruptor to our community at the moment is not the speed of communications which we could see it coming or other issues. We've actually tried hard in recent times to get the labour costs under control and just as we're starting to do that, all of a sudden, we're now going to be blown out of the water because of energy costs, gas and electricity. The disruptor is the failure of politicians to actually deliver consistently a program that we can all understand. Not that we all have to agree with that vision, but that we can understand and appreciate where they're trying to take us and then we make our decisions. But it changes all the time, so all of a sudden, coal is out. The next minute we hear, we're going to invest in new clean coal. There is no such thing as clean coal. I'm not opposed, I'm a, totally opposed to closing down Hazelwood, as the Victorian government did recently, without having a replacement energy source. But this is madness. This thing in South Australia is madness. And under normal circumstances, you would have imagined the Conservatives out there fighting against it. Except in this case, they beat the Socialists in South Australia to their own game. They tax the banks. They're attacking the banks. They're undermining our confidence. So, ladies and gentlemen, as you sit here today, we are in uncharted waters. We don't know what's going to happen next. All we can hope to do as individuals is best protect and develop our own lives, that of our families and that of our businesses. I want to talk to you a bit, if I may, about just a couple of things in terms of this issue of vision. If this organisation didn't have a vision, you wouldn't be here today. If you weren't being called together from the various states of Australia to hear the banks and to hear other people talk to you on technical issues, if there wasn't a reason for doing it, you wouldn't be here. But if I was to ask any of you today where you think any politician, any political party, government or opposition, want to take Australia by 2050, who can tell me? Anyone? I've got no bloody idea. And nor do you. 
So actually, here as an organisation, a network of businesses, you are doing so much better than those we elect for governors. When I talk of a vision, the thing that's annoyed me most, I don't miss the minutiae of politics, don't get me wrong, but I miss the big picture. And I'd like to think in Victoria in the early 80s we started creating that vision for Victoria through, through to the year 2020 and 2050. But the thing that I've been arguing most for in Australia for the last 20 years is the need to have a national water policy. Water is important for us as human beings, it's important for the quality of our soil. We have no national water policy. We have so much of our land that is arid. We have so much of our productive land that does not receive sufficient water on a regular basis. So those of you who have come from Perth, you're now in the grips of a drought which is going to severely affect particularly those farmers to the south of Perth again. Where in the past, when you've had prolonged droughts, it has been the area of the highest suicide rate among senior men. We have no national water policy. We have no national food policy. And why do I say that? Because immediately to our north, I divide the world into three parts. Europe, the Americas, Asia. And we're the anchor port of Asia. We're very small, 23 million people, grand land mass. But up north now, China, Japan, Indonesia, they've all become net importers of food. We sell bits and pieces to them, but not in a coordinated manner. We should have a vision by 2050 to actually be able to feed 500 or a billion people. There's four billion up there at the moment. By that stage, there'll be many more. New Zealand and Israel have a better reputation than us for providing food to that part of the world. Now, if you were to have a national water, a national food policy, and you invested in it heavily, you would need skilled people, you'd need unskilled people, and you'd need semi-skilled people. What's the biggest threat to all of us as individual parents at the moment? The opportunity for our children and our grandchildren to have an occupation. And it's shrinking very, very quickly. And I don't necessarily mean employment, I mean doing something worthwhile with their day and or night, part of which may be employment. It all may be employment. But if we don't have our young occupied, they become bored, they become ill, they reach out, they get seduced by those flogging drugs, etc., etc., and up goes our crime rate. We don't have a vision for this country that talks solely or primarily about growth. We actually have a vision that talks about increasing tax, trying to reduce the debt by actually attacking those who are still making money. And eventually, you won't be able to attack them anymore again, such as our banks. So one of the things I want you to take away from here today is just thinking about Australia 2050. My youngest granddaughter will probably live to 100 years, by rote. I don't like the idea of retirement. If you retire, you die. You've got to stay occupied. What's going to occupy us? I've been given a very short time. <laughs> Noise me intensely. <laughs> Can I therefore just talk about what happened on the phone when I had a briefing? with your people for this particular conference because I think this is where it's all going to end up. As most of you know, I started a thing called Beyond Blue in the year 2000. When my daughter came to me, she was a student at uh, Deakin University, which is, for those of you who don't know Victoria, in the Western District, and two of her male friends had just died in totally unrelated car accidents within a week. And she came up to Geelong, drove up to Melbourne in tears. I was Premier at the time and she said, Dad, what can you do to stop these young men dying on the roads? And I thought and she thought that we were talking about the road toll. But because I had a bit of influence then, I got some information on those deaths very quickly and found out that both of those young men had been left by their partners. One was engaged and those ladies, well educated, decided they want to follow careers in the city which were not available in rural Victoria. And that was their right. These young men couldn't handle it, turned to grog, used their motor vehicles to take their lives. So they are suicides. And what has occupied most of my community time over the last 17 years has been beyond blue. 
and I hand over the reins to Julia Gillard uh, next Friday. Time for change, change is always good. But when we spoke on the phone, when Mark spoke, Jenny spoke and Saffron spoke, they asked me to talk about well-being and health. And I've learned a great deal over the last 17 years. I'm not an expert, I'm not a professional, but I'm a well-educated layperson now. And I said to them, what do you have in place for your staff and or your broker network to help them deal with change, to help them manage what I predict will be perhaps the most challenging period we have faced in our lives over the next 18 months? And for those under 40 who have never experienced any challenge to our economic base, it'll be something totally out of the blue. And as we know today, 2017 compared to 20, 30 years ago, most individuals take less responsibility for their own well-being than we used to. So we rely on governments, we rely on other people, we rely on someone else, rather than accepting responsibility for ourselves. And so therefore, Mark and the team have agreed to put in place a program or a point of contact for you guys and your staff to actually to refer to when you feel that you may be under stress or anxious or any of your members of your particular businesses do. And why is that important? Because most stresses and anxieties can be addressed and cured if dealt with quickly. So I want to give you a couple of pointers to take away if I may. And at the end of my address we'll take questions, answers and abuse whichever comes naturally to you but I have more fun with the latter. <laughs> so let me again put a question to you to see if I can get a response. How many of you, when you woke up this morning, gave thanks for waking up? One, two, three. Come on, is that a hand up or is it a tickle? <laughs> Maybe four. So let's say there's close five. Maybe there's 1,000 people in this room. Maybe there's 500. Of that five people, have said waking up is something to celebrate. Does that not tell you that we have all become terribly complacent with our lives? Life can be extinguished like that. I keep thinking about those four young people going down the dream world water slide on the Gold Coast, laughing their heads off, water spraying in their faces, the thing tips over and they're dead. Or you look at what's happening in London. How can we possibly take our lives for granted? How can we take our children's life? How can you take your staff's life for granted? So there for me, for me, when I wake up in the morning, it's not a religious thing necessarily, but I give thanks for waking up. Doesn't matter whether it's someone up there, down there, dogs in the kennel, people you're sleeping with at the time, does not matter. <laughs> is my rock. Now you might have different rocks. Probably none of you have any rocks. But it might be your children's your rock. It might be your partner's your rock. It might be your garden. Why do you need a rock? You need a rock so that at the end of every day you can measure, ask yourself, what have I done well? Wash it out of your mind. What have I done less well or badly and how could I have avoided that or how can I correct it tomorrow? But importantly, you can ask yourself, well, how does that mistake, how does that stress, that anxiety, measure up against my rock, which is something that is so meaningful to you, whatever you'd establish it is. So when I lost an election a few years ago, there'll be a few Victorians here, and some of them will have contributed to that. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> I must admit I was a bit surprised at the result. But against my rock, it's only rated a one or one and a half. No one had been hurt, was in the natural order of things, take it on board, I resign, move on, get on with the rest of my life. My parents died a few years ago, a year apart, both in their 80s, lived good lives, little illness, sad to see them go. Against my rock, I was able to manage that change. Sometimes I may have abused someone. Some people say, I have. <laughs> I find it hard to believe, but some say I have. <laughs> well, again, I ask myself, how could I avoid that, etc., etc. 
If Hawthorne were not to win the Premiership this year, it would probably rate as a 9 or 10 against my rock. But again, with a bottle of whisky, I'll get over it fairly quickly. <laughs> but do you see what I'm trying to say? If you have something that to you is so important that it forms your rock, you can prioritise the things that cause you stress and anxiety and wash them out of your mind before you go to sleep every night. It's a discipline you've got to develop so that you then can sleep well, whether you sleep for five hours a night or eight hours. There's no point going to bed at night, tossing and turning because something is annoying you and waking up the next day as though you haven't slept at all. There's another reason why this technique is important, because you owe it to your children to develop the same sort of discipline and to your staff. So many of us now say, oh, it's up to the education system, it's up to the teachers. No, it's not, it's up to us. To actually set by example, not by instruction to our children, how they can better live with their lives and how they can deal with the things that cause them anxiety and stress. And if you can teach them that from an early age, they'll have it for the rest of their life. And the same with your staff. So if you go away from here today, take on board all the learnings, technical things, but just come back to the most important thing of all, which is your own condition. If you'd asked me a few years ago what's the most important thing in my life, I would have said my wife and my children. Now I say it's me, my health, mental and physical. And that's not egotistical. But I know that if I'm going to meet my responsibilities to my family, my businesses, the charities that I'm involved in, football clubs, matters not, I've got to be in the best health possible, mentally and physically. And you don't press that on others. You don't talk about it. You simply do it through example. You encourage people to get their priorities right. So if I'm right, and I hope I'm wrong, but even if I'm wrong, what I'm suggesting to you might happen in Australia over the next 18 months. If you take on board what I'm saying about your own condition, your own health, the welfare of your staff, your children, your grandchildren, you're going to be in a better place anyway. And if I'm right, and what I predict might happen, that is a squeezing of the economy, then you'll be in a better place to handle it. And there are so many examples of where organisations that have been squeezed have actually realigned themselves to, be, to get through the hard times and continue to grow. So today, I don't care that you accept my rock as your rock, but to me, waking up is terribly important. It's everything. To have another 24 hours is absolutely exciting. Secondly, with that rock to be able to measure the things that cause you stress and anxiety, and they will often then say, hey, this thing that I'm worrying about compared to my children, or com it's nothing. What am I talking about? Why am I wasting time on this? How do I correct it? I then also want you to think about the importance of, obviously, good health by your own standards what you eat, what you exercise, etc., etc. The last thing, as much as I love visiting senior people in AIDS facilities, none of us want to go there. So we want to try and avoid it as best we can. And we can only do that if we are serious about our mental and our physical condition. The worst thing you can do is ask to a person who has a few years under the belt, how are you? Because invariably, they'll tell you. <laughs> and then it's about their pureed food or their urinary tract or some other thing. And as you progress through life, if you don't stay occupied, your focus narrows to self. And you can't have a conversation with these people. They may be family, whatever. But their focus is narrow. So never think about retiring. Not to say you have to be broken for the rest of your life, but make sure you plan to be active, to be occupied. Sometimes you might be working two or three days a week for a financial return. Sometimes you may garden for a day. You may look after the grandkids for another day. It doesn't matter. Just go to bed every night physically and mentally tired. And that will make sure that a lot of the illnesses that you would otherwise face will not come your way. So, as I said, what was good about this discussion the other day with Mark and his team was this concept that this organisation, 
Not only has our responsibility to provide you with technical skills and access to good banks and good people, etc., they also have a responsibility to your health. But it's not the first responsibility. The first responsibility is each and every one of you, as it is mine. But then to be able to give you, through the methods we have of communication today, the points of contact that you can use. I met a young man downstairs uh, earlier who was a member of this conference who came up and apologised. He had to go to a meeting, obviously, to make money, uh, which is fair enough. Uh, but he said to me, he just came up and said, look, I want to thank you for what you've done at Beyond Blue. I have used your website on a number of occasions and it has been terribly important to me. So, Mark, I'd like to suggest that one of the things that uh, AFG can do is actually have a connect to our website on all of the stuff that AFG put out so that you can, in the privacy of your own home, do a self-analysis, find out more about some of these illnesses while you're in good health so that you can recognise change and, importantly, recognise change in family or recognise change in some of your workforce. There's, a, there's wonderful tools out there, but it's like so many other things in life. When we're reasonably fit and well, we tend not to worry about the potential of being unwell. It's best to educate yourself about things like depression uh, mental illnesses while you're fit so that you can recognise signs as you go along. So here we are, end of the financial year 2017. We're all survivors and hopefully we'll all be survivors in 12 months from now. But the economic seas are going to get choppier and choppier and choppier. And there's nothing we can do about it individually except get ourselves in the best condition to address it. Your relationships with your clients becomes terribly important because once a client comes to you for technical advice, they also want to leave your office feeling uplifted. They want to go away saying, this broker knows what he or she is talking about. These people are interested in my life. They're interested in my welfare. And so therefore, every one of your officers can make a contribution into the condition of the Australian community by being positive, by being professional. And at times you might find a client who is not well or is behaving differently than when they last came into your office. And you might ask them, are they all right? You may recommend they go and have a look at this website. We can actually get to mark brochures, all sorts of things you like free of charge to put in your offices if you want them. In other words, I'm saying be proactive, don't sit back. Understand yourself, importantly, understand your client. As I indicated, there's not much you and I can do about what or what is not happening in Canberra. Suffice to say, it's going to be tough. But properly structured, properly conditioned, everyone will get through it. But that means we have to be ourselves very focused. We have to understand where we want our businesses to be in five years. We want to make sure that we've got the first and the second best people around us to help us and to give us the skills that we might not have. So challenging times. So my time is almost up. I now want to throw it over to questions, answers and abuse. So if you've got any question on anything I've said, let's have it. And if you haven't... No, hey, hey. Off. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll disclose I'm a Hawthorne fan as well. Here, here. Good man. Very, um, very So, cute. Jeff, obviously we've got a lot of uh, interesting times in Australia. What do you think the Trump factor is happening, uh, having on the world as well? Because uh, that's a very different situation in the US at the moment. Well, it's not just Trump. It's what's happened in uh, France. It's what's happened in the UK to a degree. There is this disruptor factor and no one knows how it's going to work out. I've always said of people who are in politics before they get to the top, you've got to have 15 to 20 years experience. You've got to do your apprenticeship before you get to the top to be effective. The challenge Trump has, of course, he's never been a politician and then doesn't understand how the system works. So he's doing a lot of 
He's saying a lot of things that he believes in, but the community is so surprised by it or upset by it, uh, he's getting this response. In France, the disruptor was at work uh, in terms of the new president, Mr Macron, and the Socialist Party there has almost disappeared altogether and the Conservatives are back but very much reduced. So people are looking for change. And it's why I asked you all that question before. Where do you think you line up? Because my greatest worry is under our system of government, we're not electing a Prime Minister, we're electing political parties. And there was a Prime Minister of Australia, our second, fourth and sixth Prime Minister, called Alfred Deakin. And he described the Parliament at the time, after Federation in 1901, have made up of three 11s, three cricket 11s. And at any stage, two of the 11s could gang up on the other and change the government. And that's what happened in those early years. Governments changed very, very quickly. Well, I compare that with today. You fundamentally have three 11s in the Senate. So you've got Labor, Conservatives and the others. You've got five independents in the House of Reps and the Conservatives have got a majority of one. But the way polling is going at the moment, you might find a lot more independents in the Parliament, in the lower house after the next election. And any two of the groupings could defeat the government of the day. Now my view is that we haven't had good government in this country for 13 years. The last, second last election, the Howard years, he started throwing money at the community to re-win the election. That's when the period of entitlement started. And he won that election. He tried it the next one, he was beaten by Kevin Rudd. Then you had the personality splits, which continue right through to today. What effect does, that, does Trump have on us? It's disruptive, but it should be a warning to us. But the warning should go to those who offer to leaders. We want leaders. We want people who are prepared to govern. We want people who are prepared to give us a vision. So the greatest effect on Trump, for me, is learning from the lesson. That's the real issue. And the fear is, that we won't and that we'll bumble our way into the next election which I anticipate will be held in the middle of next year, August, and we could end up with three 11s in both houses. Well, that'll be the time you get, you get in your boat and take a holiday for a year and a half. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yes? Yeah, Jeff, when are you running for Canberra, mate? Yeah, no, no, thank you. Hold your applause, hold your applause. The beauty thing is I can say what I like without any responsibility whatsoever. Uh, and I'm too young to go into federal parliament. I need more experience, but I'm working on it. But again, look, it's not about, <laughs> it's not about me, please. Uh, <laughs> but it is about trying to influence those who lead it. I don't care. I, you know, when you get out of politics, the sort of competition leads you a bit. In Beyond Blue I've always had a bipartisan board. In the group The Torch which deals with Indigenous Aborigines in jail that I'm heading up and that'll be my community contribution for the next 10 years, it's bipartisan. It's why I've taken so long to get, in this case, Julia Gillard to replace me at Beyond Blue. Uh, a, because a bit like me, you either love her or hate her. Uh, she'll act as a lightning rod and it's very hard for not-to-profits to get noticed given all the clutter that's out there at the moment. But you do need to find, as the politics drains out of you, you can work in a bipartisan way. You do want to see, I don't care if it's a good Labor government. Well, I do a little bit, but I, <laughs> I don't mind. I'd rather have a good Labor government than a bad Conservative government. I just want someone to tell me and my children and my grandchildren where we're going. Because I was in the army for a while. Please don't misunderstand. But this country is only strong and independent as long as it is socially and economically strong. And when and if we splinter socially, and some of the things I've talked about earlier today are putting those splinters in place, that's when someone else will look at this landmass and say, hey, let's have it. We're lucky we didn't lose it in the Second World War. We haven't got enough people. We haven't got enough armaments to defend Tasmania, let alone the mainland. So the only way we're going to be strong 
is if we're economically and socially strong. That's what our leadership should understand. Who's next? <laughs> yes, lady here. I have two parts to my question. The first is, do you believe that with foreign ownership rules in Australia, we're going to have enough food to first feed Australians than abroad? And my second question is, we have noticed, even within our industry, a lot of middle-tier jobs going to cheaper labour countries. Um, and you did speak about jobs for our kids. So is there anything further you can add to that? Uh, in terms of feeding ourselves, yes, people have been buying our continent for years. First the Brits, now the Americans, and now more recently the Chinese. But there are some instances already where the Chinese have sold, and the Japanese, sorry, before the Chinese. The Japanese have almost moved out, but they invested a lot in recreation, etc. Good stuff, we've got them, they can't take them with them, and some industries. China is buying a more uh, complex group of assets, but again, in terms of the total, it's still fairly small. But they wouldn't be buying, to your point, if we had a policy that said by 2050 we are going to feed a billion people because we would be coordinating what we're doing. We don't even know, for instance, in China, where so many people are moving from agricultural-based communities into metropolitan communities, how their eating habits are changing. And they are dramatic. We should have teams of people in all of these countries understanding what the community want try to get ahead, provide them with what they want. So, so, no, I don't see it as a real risk at the moment, but it need not have happened to the extent that it has, and it need not happen for the future if we were coordinated. I mean, we've got all these bloody policies. I mean, the NBN, $50 billion. By the time it's completed, the technology will be old, and the speed of transferring information will be gone. We have 50 billion, how many South Australians here? You lucky people, you lucky people. <laughs> We've spent 50 billion dollars on building, what is it, six or eight subs. We could have bought them off the shelf for 20 billion. We've got the NDIS, which I happen to support, but we haven't got it properly tightened. That's another 50 billion. That's 150 billion dollars the vast majority of which, except for the NDIS, is wasted money. And who are we imposing that waste on? Our children and our grandchildren. So the second part of your question was losing jobs, moving offshore. Again, we can't have a walled country. We've got to be competitive. And that's where I said earlier we're trying to get on top of labour costs. And I think in some cases we've done it. And, you know, in the days when things were being made in China very cheaply, some of those things are now being made back here. Some of those things have been made back in America. Some of those things that were being made in China have now moved to the Philippines or somewhere else. So there's always going to be movement. We've got to make sure that we can do things economically, we can do them in volume, which means we can't just do them for the Australian 23 million. You think for a moment how many things we have in this country that we export to the world as opposed to the things that we import. The three companies that I think are the standouts in Australia in terms of development, et cetera, et cetera, has been ComputerShare, which is the share register business which started off in Melbourne, now worldwide. Cochlear, the ear plant, again, that came out of science in Melbourne, now worldwide and a worldwide leader. And CSL, the bud refraction company, which was a government-owned business sold 20, 30 years ago are now one of the business in the world. But you go to some of the, even the, the, the Swedish, Norway type companies, and they're developing all sorts of products and, that we don't. So most of our stuff we import. We've got to make sure that we are competitive and we've always got to be looking for something that we can contribute. And to be quite honest, after the air we breathe and the water we drink, the most important thing we need for survival is food. So does the rest of the world. And I told John Howard about this in 1996. I told Kevin Rudd. I told John, uh, Malcolm Turnbull. I don't know. No one listens. So either I'm stupid, which I probably am, please. Don't anyone get excited. But, 
But it just annoys me intensely that common sense doesn't seem to be a very well played out objective. All right, we've got time for one more. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, Jeff. I'm and one over there. There's two. Uh, yes. You're right. uh, Jeff, I'm very interested in regards to your comments about the economy and, and what you see happening in the next 12 to 18 months. I also note that Treasury and the Reserve Bank and the most recent budget that came out have come out with some pretty positive predictions about economic growth at like 3% and wages increasing. Can you give us your thoughts about where those particular government departments might be motivated to, to make such predictions? No. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Gentlemen over here. Jay. 20 years ago, you had cemented the Victoria economy. You set a solid foundation for Victoria. I from SA. You know that SA, we build a hospital for a billion dollars. We can't even move in after 12 months. If you are the Jay Weatherhill advisor, what is the three advice you give it to him so that we can bring it back to SA? Now, I'm going to try and interpret what you said <laughs> in the nicest way possible. You were firstly talking about South Australia? Absolutely, yeah. Was that right? Yeah. And you were talking about the hospital over there, which is the third most expensive hospital you've built in the world which hasn't opened yet? That's right. And what were you going to say to me then? I said, if you are the advisor for Jay Weatherhill, Hugh, he's our obviously state premier, what is the three most important advice you'd be giving to him? Resign. <laughs> infrastructure is very good. We need infrastructure, hospital, etc., etc. But the best thing we've got to do is focus on helping people stay out of hospitals, which is really what I've been talking to you about today. You will avoid hospitals if you're mentally and physically well, or you're less likely to use them. And unfortunately, we have become a society that responds, reactive. We are not proactive. I wonder how many of you in your businesses with your staff have some sort of encouragement that encourages them to be physically active. You know, to go out walking, to take them away every now and then on a, an exercise, to do something different. I had a friend of mine the other day who was saying uh, they're taking, oh, it was one of the other banks, and they're taking their senior management away next week for one of these love ins, and that's good. And I said, Fantastic. But why don't you take them and trek Kokoda? Get away. Get into a different environment. See the greenery, the freshness, the wonderment of those young people that live along the track, the indigenous people. Actually extend the hand of support to someone who's having trouble climbing up a hill or falls down you know, the, the slope. Bond together in something that makes sense that you can talk about. I've sent a number of my people at Beyond Blue and other places on Dakota and other sites, uh, such things. I've done it three times. I've done the Sandakan Death March. They are just wonderful experiences. It takes you right back to sort of the meaning of life in the nicest way. When you see those villages along the way, the people have got no money. They trade between themselves. The children have all got little pot bellies. They're all happy. There's no paper on the ground, no bloody telephones. They're so proud of their little campons. There's not a, the grass has been cut away, the dirt is clean. And you think back, as I did with one occasion, and I said to the guy I was walk, trekking with, I said, just think back to Australia. Where is this goodness replicated in Australia? And it's not in metropolitan areas, because we're so busy doing our own thing, we don't stop to think about quality of life and how fortunate we are in real terms, how fortunate we are to live, to wake up in the morning. So, I wish you all well. I thank uh, Mark and the team for actually taking on board my suggestion that your health is important to them as their employees' health. Because if you're not healthy, then the whole financial collective of the group suffers. Have a good day. Thank you.